Okay, so if we look at number one, we're given f of x equals x squared plus 3x minus 1. And we're trying to find our difference quotient, which is the formula f of x plus h minus f of x over h. So, first thing I have to do to find f of x plus h is put an x plus h in everywhere I see an x. So I'm going to have x plus h squared plus 3 times x plus h minus 1. And then I have minus f of x minus that whole function, so minus x squared plus 3x minus 1. All over h. Okay, so if I FOIL x plus h squared, I get x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. If I distribute that 3, I get plus 3x plus 3h minus 1. And then if I distribute this negative, I get minus x squared minus 3x plus 1. All over h. So far, so good. Let's cancel out what we can cancel. So now I can cancel out a 3x and a minus 3x, an x squared and an x squared, and a plus 1 and a minus 1. So what I'm left with on top is 2xh plus h squared plus 3h all over h. If I factor an h out of the top, I'm left with a 2x plus h plus 3 all over h. So then my h's cancel and I'm left with 2x plus h plus 3. And then the only thing I have to note is that since I canceled that h out of my denominator, h cannot equal 0. So any questions on number one? Okay. On number two, it says graph the function and approximate any relative mins or maxes. Identify increasing or const decreasing or constant intervals in interval notation. So these are where you're going to graph on your graphing calculators. You're going to graph the function and find where your min is, where your max is, and then you're going to put those in interval notation. So if you graph this on your graphing calculator and you want to find your minimum, you would hit the second calc button and go to minimum. And what are you going to get? Yeah, that's pretty close. Some calculators do it differently. So what did you get? Negative. Zero point zero three eight. And negative 0 0.1. Okay, and you should have two minimums. What was your other minimum? Really don't. Okay, there should be two of them because your graph, I think, looks something like this. So then that would be the first one. Your second one is just a mere image of your first one, so it would be positive 1.038, negative 0 0.808. Okay, so the difference in your minimums is you're going to have two, one that's negative, one that's positive. Okay, and if you've got something close to that on your calculator, that's right, because everything rounds differently. So like my calculator gave me negative 1.14 but everything rounds differently. What's going to be your maximum? Mm -hmm. Put that into your calculator. I want to see what you get. Because that's not what you should get. Nope. Yep. So 
unless I did something wrong, I guess. That e to the negative 6 is meaning you have to move the decimal point back 6 places. Same thing with e to the negative 12. So it's actually really, really close to what value? Zero. Zero. Yep. So you should get, you're going to get like negative 2 point something something and then it'll go on and on and then it'll say e to the 6 or it'll say e to the 12. That just means that you have to move that decimal point back so it's really, really close to zero, zero. If you zoom in on your graph, you would get that as well. Um, and so then if we have those, then we can figure out our increasing, decreasing, and constant intervals. So interval notation says that we use brackets and parentheses. So what are we increasing from? Okay. Two. Okay. And we're increasing from point zero three eight to infinity. So you're increasing twice. That's when your graph is going up. So when are we decreasing then? So 1.038, so negative infinity that negative 1.038, and then also decreasing from to 1.038. Okay, so when are, when are we constant? None. Yeah, we're never constant. We're either always increasing or always decreasing. Okay. If we look at number three, it says graph the function g of x equals x cubed minus two when x is less than or equal to zero and four x plus one when x is greater than zero. So I'm going to make two tables of values to represent my two functions. So if x is less than or equal to zero, then I'm going to use values like zero, negative one, negative two. So my first one, and if x is greater than 0, I'm going to use 0 again, but just to give me a baseline of where my function starts, and 1, and 2. So if I plug in 0, 0 cubed is 0, 0 minus 2 is negative 2. If I plug in negative 1, negative 1 cubed is negative 1, negative 1 minus 2 is negative 3. And if I plug in negative 2, negative 2 cubed is negative 8, negative 8 minus 2 is negative 10. Okay, so for my first function, if I go to sketch a graph, I'm at 0, negative 2, and that's a closed circle because I am equal to that x at 0, and negative 1, negative 3, and negative 2, negative 8 is somewhere down here. So my graph looks something like that. If I plug in values into my second function, if I plug in 0, 4 times 0 is 0 plus 1 is. If I plug in 1, 4 times 1 is 4, 4 plus 1 is. And if I plug in 2, 2 times 4 is 8 plus 1 is 9. So I know I'm at points 0, up 1, but I'm not equal to 0 at that point, so it's an open circle. I'm also over at 1, up 5, so I'm somewhere up there, and 2, 9 is way up there. So my graph looks something like this. So you should have two lines, half of one going down, the other one going up. 
Um, you have to look at your inequality symbol. So since this one was less than or equal to, it's a closed circle. Since this one is just greater than, it's an open circle. If it's got that line underneath, then it's a closed circle. Okay. Any other questions on number three? Okay. Number four, we're asked to find those six different composite functions using f of x equals x cubed minus 4 and g of x equals the cube root of x plus 7. So for the first one, f plus g of x just tells me I'm adding my function. So f of x is x cubed minus 4. g of x is the cube root of x plus 7. So you should get x cubed minus 4 plus the cube root of x plus 7. You cannot simplify that any further, so then you're done. For f minus g, my f of x function is x cubed minus 4. g of x function is cube root of x plus 7. So I get x cubed minus 4 minus the cube root of x plus 7. Okay, for f g of x, we are multiplying, so my function is x cubed minus 4 times cube root of x plus 7. You cannot simplify that. For f over g of x, we're dividing. f of x is x cubed minus 4. g of x is cube root of x plus 7. And you cannot simplify that. For f composite g of x, that tells me that I'm plugging g of x into f of x. So I'm going to have the cube root of x plus 7 cubed minus 4. Okay, then my cube and my cube root cancel. And so I'm left with x plus 7 minus 4. And how does that simplify? x plus 3. So f composite g of x should be x plus 3. And then lastly, g of f of x tells me I'm putting f of x into g of x. So the cube root of x cubed minus 4 plus 7. And then negative 4 plus 7 gives me what? Well, negative 4 plus 7 gives me 3, so cube root of x cubed plus 3. Do we have any question on our composite functions? All right, if I look at number 5, find the inverse of the function of f, graph them. Describe the relationship, state the domain, and range. This would be very good to know for your final. So if f of x equals x cubed minus 4, then to find my inverse, I'm going to switch my x and y, so I get x equals y cubed minus 4. And then I need to solve that for y. So to get rid of minus 4, I add 4. So y cubed equals x plus 4. How do I get rid of a cube? Cube root. So I take the cube root of each side. So y equals cube root of x plus 4. That is my inverse function. Okay, for part b, all you're going to do is plug those into your graphing calculator and you're going to sketch the graph. Put both in. Yep. So for my f of x, down 4, down 5. OK, so for my f of x function, my first function, not my inverse, I get a graph that looks something like that. For my inverse function, Oh, that's too far. Down 
down four, down up. My F inverse function looks like that. It basically just looks like them folded over. Okay, so that's what you should get if you plug them in your graphing calculator. For part C, it says describe the relationship between them. What is the relationship between my inverse and my original function? They are not parallel, but they look kind of parallel. What happens to my x's and y's between my original and my inverse? They flip, right? So x and y are flipped. It's the same thing that happens to your axes when you graph them. Your axes flip, which is why they end up looking very similar but a little bit different. And then lastly, domain and range. So f of x, domain and range. F inverse of x, domain and range. And so domain refers to all of your x values, and since these go on and on forever and ever, we have all real numbers as my domain for my x's. Range refers to your y values. So because my graph goes on and on forever and ever, my range is also all real numbers. Because your inverse is just your original function flipped, your domain and range for your inverse function are flipped, but they're the same, so all real numbers. Good on number four. Oh, that was number five. Good on number five. Okay. Number six. A company has found that the daily demand X for its boxes of chocolate is inversely proportionate to the price P. When the price P is five dollars, the demand is one hundred and eighty thousand boxes. Approximate the demand when the price is eight dollars. So your inversely proportionate formula is y equals k over x. And it tells you that x is 180,000 boxes when your price p is $5. And then it wants you to find your x when your price p is $8. So when my price is $5, my x value is 180,000. So I need to solve that to find my k. How do I solve that to find my k value? Multiply. Yeah, multiply by 180,000. Okay, so what is k equal then? 900,000. So if k equals 900,000, and I need to find my x when my p is $8. So when 8 equals 900,000 divided by my x, in order to solve that, I flip my x and my 8. So I end up with x equals 900,000 divided by 8. So what does x equal then? One hundred twelve thousand five hundred. So my demand for my chocolates when my boxes are eight dollars instead of five dollars goes down to one hundred twelve thousand five hundred. So any questions on number six? All right, number seven says verify f of x equals 8x cubed and g of x equals a cube root of x over 2 or inverses. Explain your answer. So verify our inverses. We have to figure out if f of g of x equals 1. That's how you verify an inverse. You composite function the two functions together and then you figure out if they equal 1. So if I go to do that, f is 8x cubed, so 8, but instead of having an x, g of x becomes my x. So cube root of x over 2, k 
cubed. Let's simplify this part first. A cube root and a cube will cancel. I still have two cubed. Two cubed is eight. So this becomes eight over eight, and eight over eight is one. Yay. You're putting the two functions together. So f of g of x. Because they equal one. The x is you ignore the x. You just want to make sure the other number is simplified to one. I just ignored the x. Okay. If I look at number eight, write the equation in vertex form. Also good for your final. F of x equals two x cubed minus two x plus twelve. Yes, this is one another one that would be good to know for your final. Five. Told you five was good to know for your final. All of eight is done in your graphing calculator. So you need to put that function into your graphing calculator and run go step by step how to figure all that stuff out. So everybody should have 2x squared minus 2x plus 12 into their graphing calculator, please. I'm going to skip to the bottom. If we have this graph in our graphing calculator, does this open up or down? Up. Okay, so opens up. Okay, if it opens up, does that mean it's a min or a max? Min. Okay, so min is how we find our vertex. So you're going to go to second calc and go down to your minimum. And you need to find your minimum because your minimum is going to give you your vertex. The minimum is the vertex, yes. Go to second calc and then put a minimum. Okay, so what do we get for our vertex? Zero point five and eleven point five. Okay, once you have your vertex, you can figure out your line of symmetry because your line of symmetry is your x value at your vertex. So what's my x value at my vertex? <laughs> zero point five. So my line of symmetry is negative zero point five. To find your y-intercepts, your y-intercepts are where x equals 0. So you need to type into your graph x equals 0 and figure out what value you get. Yes, your y-intercept is where x equals 0. So you put a value, yes. So what's my y-value when x equals 0? 12. So my y-intercept is 12. Okay, your x-intercept to where it crosses the x-axis. It never crosses the x-axis, so you'll have no x-intercepts. So all of that is done on your graphing calculator. Do so you have any questions on number eight? No.
uh, put it back and then oh not what I wanted. So I go back and then trace x equals zero. And if it doesn't equal zero, then you just type it in and it'll give you so just hit your trace button. Mm, oh yeah, you don't have any x-intercepts because it never crosses the x-axis, so then. Okay. If I look at number 9, use synthetic division to show that x is a solution of the third degree polynomial of the equation and use the result to factor the polynomial completely, list all real solutions. So I'm given this polynomial and I'm told that one of my solutions is x equals 5 and I'm going to use synthetic division to solve that. So your 5 goes on the outside and your coefficients go on the inside. So 1, negative 6, negative 25, 150. Okay, you always drop your first coefficient down and then we start multiplying. So 5 times 1 is 5. What's negative 6 plus 5? Negative 1. 5 times negative 1 is negative 5. Negative 25 minus 5 is negative 30. 5 times negative 30 is negative 150. 150 minus 150 is 0, which is what we wanted. If you're not getting 0, then you did something wrong. There won't be remainder, so... I don't know. I guess you'll find out tomorrow. So your leading coefficient is x squared minus x minus 30. That's what you get for your new function because you drop your coefficient by once. So we went from a cubed to a squared. Then it says to find your remaining 0. So we're going to factor. Factors of 30 that subtract to negative 1 are 6 and 5. Negative 6, positive 5. So then x minus 6 equals 0, x plus 5 equals 0. So what are my other two factors? So x equals 6 and x equals negative 5. So my remaining two solutions, I knew I had three total because it was a cubic function. The other one is x equals 5. I give it to you. Yeah, it comes from right there. That's for me telling you it's a solution. All right, so any questions on number nine? Okay, number ten, another good one to know for you to find all. Simplify the complex number and write it in standard form. So we're given five minus six i over two minus i. For part A, to simplify a complex number, you have to multiply by the conjugate of the denominator. The conjugate of my denominator of 2 minus i is going to be 2 plus i. So I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by 2 plus i. Okay, so if I follow the top, 5 times 2 is 10. 5 times i is 5i. Negative 6 times 2 is negative 12i. And negative 6 times i is negative 6i squared. If I FOIL the bottom, 2 times 2 is 4, 2 times i is 2i, negative i times 2 is negative 2i, and negative i times i becomes negative i squared. I also know that i squared is equal to negative 1. So I'm going to plug in negative 1 for my i squareds and simplify. My 2i's on the bottom cancel. If I combine my like terms, 5 minus 12 gives me negative 7i. I still have my 10. And this i squared becomes negative 1. And negative 6 times negative 1 is positive 6. So I simplified everything on top. On the bottom, this i squared becomes negative 1. Negative negative 1 becomes positive 1. So on the bottom, I have 4 plus 1. So 10 plus 6 is 16, so 16 minus 7i, 4 plus 1 is 5. If you do this correctly, you should not have any i's on the bottom. You should be left with just a whole number on the bottom. 
So any questions on part A? Okay. If I look at part B, I'm going to FOIL. 2 squared is 4. 3 times 2 is 6. Doubled is 12i. 3 squared, or 3i becomes 9i squared. When you FOIL that out, that's what you get. 4 squared is 16. 3 times 4 is 12. So that will becomes 24i. And 3i becomes 9i squared. Should be a minus 9i squared. Mm -hmm. Negative 3 times negative 4 is negative 12. Doubled is negative 24. So minus a negative becomes a positive, so it should be positive. 24. Okay, so I'm going to start combining my like terms. 4 minus 16 gives me negative 12. 12i plus 24i gives me 36i. And 9i squared minus 9i squared gives me 0. So I end up with a negative 12 plus 36i. Okay, any questions on number 10? No, okay, number 11. We are looking at factoring the polynomial listing all the possible rational zeros using our rule of signs to write out the number of possible zeros. Uh, finding our upper and lower bounds and factoring the polynomial completely. So on part A, listing all the possible rational zeros of the polynomial. We have to find our factors of our first term and our last term. And we always put our last over our first. So what are my factors of 2? 1 and 2, so positive negative 1, positive negative 2. What are my factors of 2? Positive negative 1, positive negative 2. If I then divide those, 1 divided by 1 is 1. 1 divided by 2 is 1 half. 2 divided by 1 is 2. 2 divided by 2 is 1, which we already have listed. So you should have 6 possible factors. Positive negative 1, positive negative 1 half, positive negative 2. Oh, I didn't mention. This is a good one to know for your final. To use your rule of science to write out all the possible zeros, finding your positives is really easy. Finding your negatives is a little more complicated. You're counting your number of sign changes. So how many sign changes do I have in this first function? Zero. I don't have any, right? If they're all positive. So my possible number of positive solutions is zero, meaning all of my solutions have to be negative. To find then my possible number of negative solutions, I have to find f of negative x. Okay, so if I plug in a negative x to the fourth, that will stay a positive x. So 2x to the fourth. The only thing that changes are your ones with odd exponents. Negative x cubed becomes negative x, so negative 5x cubed. All of, your all of your odd exponents turn negative. So x squared stays the same. x to the first becomes negative 5x. And 2 stays the same. So how many sign changes do I have now? I go from positive to negative, that's 1. Negative to positive, that's 2. Positive to negative, that's 3. Negative to positive, that's 4. So if I have 4 sign changes, we always go by 2's. So I can either have 4 negative solutions, or I can have two negative solutions, or I can have zero negative solutions. You always decrease your number by two. For part C, finding your upper and lower bounds. This is where you need to find your min, which equals your lower, and your max, which equals your upper, on your calculator. 
So if you find your minimum, your minimum should have been negative 2. Your maximum should have been positive 1. That comes from just finding your min and max on your calculator. And then lastly, part D, finding your zeros. That's where you figure out where you cross your x-axis. So on your calculator, go to second, calc, zeros. And that will give you all of your solutions. Okay? So x equals negative 2 x equals negative one-half, and then the last ones it will not give you, so you will have to use synthetic division, x equals positive or negative i. And it won't give you those other two because it won't give you imaginary answers. So when you find your first two, then you'll have to find your other ones by using th synthetic division. Okay. Uh, number 12, we're evaluating the rational function h of x equals 2x squared minus 5x minus 3 over x cubed minus 2x squared minus x plus 2. A good one to know for your final. So, first thing is state the domain of the function. This function has a domain everywhere except for the denominator equals 0. So your denominator equals 0, then you do not have a domain. So x cubed minus 2x squared minus x plus 2 equals 0 when x is, and this will come from your graph, 2, 1, and negative 1. So your domain all real numbers except x cannot equal 2, 1, or negative 1. That's the first part of your domain. That comes from straight from your graph. Part B says identify all of your intercepts. That again comes from your graph. So if you graph this on your graphing calculator and go to second zero, this will give you your x-intercepts, which are negative 0 0.5 and 3. Your y-intercept is done the same way you found it on your polynomial by plugging in 0 for x. Your y-intercept is negative 1.5. Part C comes from your horizontal and vertical asymptote rules, which are found on page 183 of your book. So I recommend you copy down the rules for your vertical and horizontal and slant asymptotes from page 183 of your book. Your horizontal asymptote is where your numerator equals 0. So our numerator equals 0 at y equals 0. Okay, so your horizontal asymptote is y equals 0. Your vertical asymptotes are where your denominator equals 0, and we just figured out our denominator equals 0, and x equals 2, 1, and negative 1. They're the same values that your domain cannot be. And then lastly, your slant asymptote is found by taking the top of your function and dividing it by the bottom of your function, and in this case, it is none. But those are all on page 183. So then the last thing we have to do is graph our function. So if you graph this in your graphing calculator, and then I, you need to just sketch the graph. So first things I know is I have horizontal asymptotes at y equals 0. I have vertical asymptotes at x equals 2 x equals 1, and x equals negative 1. I know that my intercepts are negative 0 0.5, so I'm going to cross my x-axis at negative 0 0.5 and at 3. And I know I cross my y-axis at negative 1.5. If I then figure out the rest of my values, I know that I've got a piece of my graph over there. 
I know that this middle part of my graph starts down, goes up. I've got some weird thing going on up top. And the rest of my graph starts down and ends up. Okay, so graph it on your graphing calculator and then just sketch the graph for me. The only thing you have to identify are your key points, so your intercepts and your asymptotes. So any questions on number 12? Okay. Number 13, a good one to know for your test, were how to graph exponential functions. So we're going to graph 3 to the x minus 1 and log base 3 of x plus 1. You are going to graph these in your graphing calculator and you are going to copy down a few values for me. I don't care which values you copy down. So I'm going to do 0, 1, and 2. So if I do 0, 1, and 2, 0 becomes 0. 1 is 2. 2 is 8. Okay. So what if I graph that 0, 0? Over 1, up 2, over 2, up 8 is somewhere up here. I know that my graph looks something like that. Oh no, it goes the other direction. My arrows go the other direction, sorry. It looks like this. That's much easier to draw. Okay, so you should get a graph that goes like that. On your graphing calculator, you should be able to copy the, table, the values from your table. If we do the same thing for log base 3 of x plus 1, remember that you can find log base anything under your number function on your calculator. So if you hit your number or your math button, and then you go to number, which should be the one that's highlighted at the top, you go to the bottom, you should have log base. That will give you log base, whatever you want. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0.63, 1, 2, 1. Those are some of the values from my table. Yep, go to math, and then numbers are... Oh, sorry. This is a good math. So then, this is what you get when you first push the math button. If you go to the bottom, log base, then just enter that and draw what you put in the numbers. Okay. So then, if I go to graph this on my graphing calculator, then I should get those values. So 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. 0.631, 2, 1. So my log base graph looks something like that. What's up? Okay. Thank you. Okay, so any questions on 13? Remember, this is a good one to know for your final. Okay. 14, also a good one to know for your final. Log base 2 of 128, and it asks you to change the base of that log. So this is in the form log base A of X. And so to change the base of your form, you use the formula log of X divided by log of A. So then if I pull those numbers out of my formula, my x is going to be 128, so log of 128, my a is 2 divided by log of 2, and then you plug that into your calculator using your log button, and you end up with what? Seven. 
So to change your base, you end up with 7. We're going to skip 15 for now. We're going to go 16. I'll go back to 15 at the end. So you need to know how to do 16 for your final. So if I look at 16, solve the equation 2 to the 2x minus 3 equals 32. I need to make those be in the same bases. So I can change 32 to be a base 2 because 32 is the same thing as 2 to what exponent? So this becomes 2 to the 5th. When my bases are the same, then I can cancel them. So I end up with 2x minus 3 is equal to 5. How do I get rid of a minus 3? Plus 3. 5 plus 3 is 8. So if 2x equals 8, what does x equal? 4. Good. I'm glad you think three is you throw on your final. I hope it's all easy. All right, 16b says 10 minus 6 natural log of x equals 10. I need to get my natural log of x by itself, so how do I get rid of this 10? Subtract 10. So negative 6 natural log of x equals 0. Okay, divide by negative 6. So natural log of x equals 0. In order to get rid of a natural log, we have to take e to that natural log of x. So then our e and our natural log cancel. So I get x equals e to the 0. And anything to the power of 0 is 1. So x equals 1. Alright, you need to know how to do 17 for your final. Determine the time necessary for $2,000 to double at an interest rate of 15% when it's compounded annually or continuously. So your annually formula is A equals P times 1 plus r over n to the nt power. Your continuous formula is a lot easier to remember. It's a equals part pe to the rt. So it tells you that your p is 2,000. It tells you your interest rate is 15%, which is 0 0.15. It wants to know how much time, so t is what we're looking for. It takes for that to double. So $2,000 doubled is $4,000. So my amount is going to be $4,000. So if I start with my more complicated formula for annually, my A is 4,000, my P is 2,000, my rate is 0 0.15, annually is the same thing as saying once, so once per year, so my N is 1 and my T is what we're looking for. If I simplify to get rid of that 2,000, I'm going to divide by 2,000. And 4,000 divided by 2,000 is 2. So 2 equals 1. And 0 0.05 divided by 1 is 0 0.15. 1 plus 0 0.15 is 1.15. So that becomes 1.15. And 1 times t is t. We did a lot of simplifying there. Hopefully we all followed. To get rid of a base, we have to take the log of that base, just like we did with the E. So log base 1.15 of 2 equals log base 1.15 of 1.15 to the T. That then cancels. So T is equal to log base 1.15 of 2. And log base 1.15 of 2 gives you approximately 7.27. .27. So t would equal 7.27. .27. Alright, we'll finish reviewing tomorrow for a couple minutes and then you will take your final tomorrow and if you don't finish you'll take it on Thursday.